appreciate it. I'm, I'm uh, glad to be here and I have a lot of information. I've been working in this industry for 45 years, as was mentioned, and I'm going to go through a lot of slides tonight. I've got a lot of information and some of it, and I thought, you know, uh, should I just share a basic approach or should I get to the point where I can cover a lot of ground with you and you guys can go back and reference these materials here later on to uh, dig out more of what you want or where your interest may be. But uh, I used to teach classes for education week uh, at BYU, Idaho. It was Rick's college back then, but uh, it was fascinating with some of the interactions and so forth that we got. Uh, one thing that I just want to brief, uh, part of where I got my experience, I ended up going to Ireland on a mission. I was back there in 73, 4, 5. Uh, it was an amazing experience. I was in both Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland, and I got a chance to see society have problems in a major way. And one night, our apartment got bombed, uh, the lower bottom corner of it, and it just rocked our building. And uh, that was the beginning of a lot of open-eyed experiences I had at that point. I grew up uh, for a year and a half in Canada, Southern Canada. We had no power, no water, no anything. We had outhouses and things of that nature as a kid uh, in my early years. And I remember that clearly. And I've had a lot of experiences that I've gleaned some of the information and some of the things I'm going to talk to you about tonight, I'm passionate about because I've learned uh, the hard way. So at any rate, I'm going to go ahead and get going here. And uh, uh, real quickly, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, why prepare for difficult times? Uh, one thing I want to make a point on, and that there's so many things we could go down, drill down on here, but I'm not going to do it. Uh, just very briefly, uh, we can be affected or impacted by anything, anytime. And it's been interesting to me lately watching what's happening in Ukraine. Have you seen how many people are on foot and how many people are dragging suitcases? They don't even have backpacks or things of that nature. And they waited too long in some cases to make essential decisions that impacted them in a major way. And then when they ended up on foot, they're in, they ended up in some of them in real serious trouble. So uh, one thing that I want to mention, never before in history have so many people become so dependent on so few for the, even the most basic necessities of life. Never in the history of the world have we ever been to this point. Uh, most people either had gardens or things of that nature in the past. Today, we live in an electronic uh, fuel energy powered society. And if, some, and if somebody came in and they pulled the plug on the power grid, we wouldn't have any water, no sewer, no communication. Uh, most of us don't have the tools, resources, garden seeds, space, or any of that kind of stuff to take care of ourselves. So uh, it's important that people understand things that they can do to stack the odds in their favor and they don't get caught off guard if and when potential things happen, which could happen to any of us anytime. Uh, and I'm not going to spend any time on this hardly, but uh, some of the greatest enemies I've discovered over the years to preparedness, readiness, are ignorance, procrastination, and indifference. Eh, I don't really care. I'm not, I don't think it's going to impact me. I'm not too worried. Uh, another key thing that I tell people when I'm working with them is you can't use what you don't have. You can't use what you don't know. And there's another part of that I add in here. You can't share what you don't have. You can't share what you don't know. And so uh, there's so many uh, interesting angles that flow through on that concept, which we'll get into a little bit as we're going through this today. And uh, the most powerful tool you have is you in any circumstance. Sometimes we may be the only person and, that we can depend on. And so if our health, our mental acuity, our emotions, things of that nature, our spiritual anchoring and so forth aren't strong enough, that can have a massive impact when the stresses and strains come, especially when people are challenged. Uh, and uh, one thing that I absolutely want to make sure, I'll bet everybody, nobody would be on this meeting today if we didn't have an online presence and if we didn't have electronics. I can't strengthen 
and mentioned this strongly enough, that it's critical to build a library of how-to books on essential things. And there's a number of them that I would highly recommend that you have all the time on hand. Uh, seed to Seed, How to Raise Garden Seeds uh, Successfully uh, on Your Own. Uh, there's just so many books out there. And I'm going to reference a few of them towards the tail end here. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me go ahead. Uh, I'm not going to be covering everything that's in the book that was put together by Michelle Jorgensen. Be prepared, not scared. I highly recommend that you get this book because it's a great reference with lots of angles, lots of ideas. And there's no way in two hours I can do justice to the topics that I'm going to be covering today. So I'm going to bring in some extra things. You can use the book as a guide. And uh, it, it doesn't have everything in there by any means, but it sure has a comprehensive angle to it, which I really appreciated. It triggers your thinking. And so, at any rate, I highly recommend this book right out of the gate. Uh, another thing, uh, preparedness levels. Uh, I don't know what angle uh, everybody's interested in pursuing in their immediate circumstances, but emergency, they talk about a 72-hour kit. We found out in studies that 72 hours is typically not quite enough. 96 hours is a little bit more realistic, and that's assuming that there's going to be help that can come that they can get to us sometimes, like when they have hurricanes or whatever, it takes three, four days for resources to get to us sometimes longer. There's a two-week level of readiness. There's the three-month level. There's a year level or more. And then one of my favorite levels, if we're not forced out of our area and we can stay where we're at or we move to a new location and we can establish, it's the renewable home production level. And so I'll get more into this here in a few minutes. Uh, one thing that I really want to point out here, too, is mobile readiness. How many here, uh, and I'm not, not going to ask for hands because I'm, I can't see all, but how many here today are uh, home-based and you feel like if you're at home, uh, nothing's going to happen. I'll be able to stay where I'm at. Nothing's going to force me out or cause me to move or whatever. Uh, so many things that could happen. But one thing I want to make mention, backpack foot mobile readiness is absolutely one of the most anchoring things you can have. In Idaho Falls here, a lot of people don't think they're going to be moving. They feel like if power goes out and so forth, you know, we're okay. We're, we're in a good area. We are. The problem is, where do you get water? How many people have wells in their backyard? Almost nobody does. So you are going to be on foot if you're in the Idaho Falls area and you're having to go out and find water to drink, let alone sanitation or uh, bathing or anything else. So if we're not ready on the foot mobile level, we can be in trouble. Uh, and uh, if you're foot mobile and you have a backpack and you've got the right resources accessible and so forth, you're always ready and you can throw it in your car easily and, and take it with you and so forth. And I'm not gonna get into a lot of this today. There's a whole bunch to it. But it's very simple to set a system up uh, checklist, which I'll make available some ideas. Vehicle readiness. Uh, and uh, all I'm going to mention on that is you can only throw so much food in a vehicle. And if it's wintertime, you've got to have winter clothes and you've got to have your family and everything. How much space do you really have if, if you're going to be forced into relocation? Recreational vehicles, RVs. And then if we don't go anywhere and we're actually home based, we still have to be mobile on foot if we get cut off from transportation resources and we can't go down and pick something up in a vehicle anymore. So backpack ready is very mobile. It's secure and it's a simple start and it doesn't cost a whole lot to do that. Uh, and uh, let's see if I can, there we go. So when it comes to preparedness, uh, there's a lot of things in this slide here, and I'm not going to get into it a bunch, but you can see there's, there's a foot mobile uh, examples in here, people that are at home, ham radio, home storage, home production, uh, a way of heating the home when the power goes out, uh, mobile or people have fuel resources like maybe propane, and that's only good until the propane runs out if it's long term. A nice thing if somebody has a 
a vehicle mobile and they have a trailer that they can hook up to a vehicle, you can carry a whole lot more. And if you have a well and you can put a manual well pump in, home production, there's all kinds of things. Uh, one of my favorite areas is if, if we're homebound and we're able to operate, uh, turn your home into a production center and uh, plant an edible landscape. And you guys are gonna cover some of this stuff later on, which, so I'm not gonna get into much of it right now. Uh, in mobile ready, there's one thing I wanna point out here. This right here, I'll show you a bigger picture here later on, but one of the most powerful tools I think anybody can have in storage is a good quality, high capacity water purifier. If you're on foot or even if you're stuck at home, but you can go out to a puddle or a pond or something like that. And, and I'm not gonna get into this because these are all hour long topics, each one of these things I'm gonna tell you about. I'm gonna give you some models that I would recommend that I, that I personally absolutely love. Uh, and I'll get more into the water purification here uh, of something that's mobile. Down here in the lower right corner, can you guys see that? Uh, Heidi, can you see this okay? Yes, I can. Can you see my cursor down here? Yes. Okay, that is what I call a pack bone. And this is a military grade, and you can get cheaper grades that don't last as long. They're not as strongly built as some of your uh, preparedness or your uh, outdoor stores or places like that. Uh, what's nice about it is if I'm on foot, I'm living at home, I'm in Idaho Falls, for example, and I have to go out for water, I can put a five gallon bucket on here and I can pack it for miles, possibly without having to set it down. If somebody had a five gallon bucket and they're having to go for water and they're carrying it by hand, uh, we've had experiments where people walked around a gymnasium and they couldn't make it around the whole, the whole gymnasium carrying five gallons of water is too heavy. So a pack board is absolutely an essential and they don't cost very much, uh, under a hundred dollars for a really good one, but boy, they can be a game changer when, the, when things get difficult if we get cut off from resources. Uh, another thing I wanna mention before I get into the rest of the presentation here is these are items, if you have a backpack, if you're based at home, these are power tools and, and the magnifying glass, we're gonna get into a little bit more later on here. But if you're on foot and you're moving longer distances, you can't, and you can't gain access to GPS, the power's gone out, we got an electromagnetic pulse scenario that took place and all of a sudden the power grid's down permanent until they can rebuild it, that kind of a thing. Uh, binoculars make us super, superhuman. We can look across the landscape and we can see if there's places of danger uh, or we can take shorter journeys. Oh, there's a, there's a big obstacle in the way. I, we need to go a different direction here or whatever. This water purifier right here is what we call a Swiss catadine water purifier. It'll do upwards of 2,000 to 5,000 gallons of water. Uh, it can stick it in a backpack and it weighs right around a pound and a quarter or so. They're very lightweight, but it is a Cadillac. It's got a silver ceramic core in it. And of all the filters I've ever seen, there's a bunch of them out there, but they don't last very long. They plug up quicker. This one here, when it plugs up, there's a brush. You can go into the filter, pull the filter out, file the outside of it down lightly put it back, clean it, put it back in, and it's all ready to go again. A phenomenal tool. This is my number one thing that I have. What You can live uh, almost a month without food, but you can only live days without water. And uh, if you get sick and you get cholera, dysentery, or some other giardia, or some other type of bacterial type things, uh, while you're uh, trying to be mobile or whatever, what a terrible thing to be sick and trying to hike or to be so sick you can't even get out of bed hardly. So they had missionaries that went down to South America. They were using the Swiss catadine and off all the ones that were using purifiers, they were the only two that didn't get sick out of 40 people that went down there. And they were using these on a daily basis, just drinking the water that was available down there. Anyway, let's get into the presentation. I just wanted to bring those up. Those are reference slides so you guys can see some things I highly recommend. And by the way, this I would have in a backpack, this I would have on your home front. And if you have to go on foot, uh, you can use a compass, but without a map, 
uh, especially when we get in areas we're not familiar with, uh, you can be in trouble. And I'm not gonna get into that right now. There's a whole discussion on that. But So we're gonna go into light, heat, fuel, and power right now. And I'm gonna brief through this fairly quickly. Uh, uh, we're gonna cover a little bit about what to store to provide light and heat during an emergency, how to stay warm and conserve heat if needed, what to buy essentials and what is optional, uh, what are essential things to, to have on hand like that water purifier I just pointed out is a phenomenal tool and how long things can be stored and how to make fire anywhere, anytime. And a few thoughts, I, I tell people, if you're on solar power, you can have your whole home set up and I don't have time to get into this. I do this for a little, I've done this for years. I always have a non-electric backup. When solar goes out, if we go through an EMP, electromagnetic pulse scenario, which has been in the news a lot lately, if that happened and we're out of power permanently until actual replacements of the equipment, transformers take place and so forth, uh, if we don't have non-electric backups and our heating system runs off of get a fuel, but it has an electronic sparker, it has a spark igniter, it has a blower, anything like that, circulation pump, as soon as the power goes out, the heat system quits, even if we have natural gas in a lot of cases or in most cases, so be aware of that. Also, uh, in one of the manuals that Heidi was referencing earlier here, have enough bedding on hand that on the coldest day of winter, if you had no other source of heat at all, you could climb under the covers and you could stay warm with just your body heat. And that's a directive that came out in one of the church manuals, just so everybody knows, uh, a recommendation. And that link I'm gonna make available here later here. But I have a full set of layered winter clothing with good quality boots. Uh, that's phenomenal foot mobility, but uh, it could keep you very alive. And I could get into winter clothing in a big way, which we don't have time right now. But I'm just giving you some thoughts, food for thought here. Uh, and there's, and, when it, and as we're getting into this, I want to mention there's active energy sources and there's passive energy sources. Active energy sources include things such as gasoline, propane. Those are all fuels, electricity. They're all things that are active. Uh, there's movement that takes place. We have to use them in equipment, so forth. Passive energy is like sunlight. I don't have to do anything in the daytime. It's there if it's not cloudy and there's ways we can use it. So I'm gonna to reference tools and things you can use here and just as we're going along. Uh, and I'm not gonna cover this very much. I'm just gonna give you some ideas of other things. Uh, rocket stove is a phenomenal tool. Uh, if you get that, it takes way less fuel. I can boil water, cook food, uh, heat up a rock, uh, heat up water to stick in a sleeping bag to take the chill off and it only takes minutes. And I can use wood scraps and twigs and things of that nature to make it operate instead of have it, having to build a big fire that wastes a huge amount of uh, firewood just to keep me warm. And, and I'll get more into this a little bit later on here. A generator is, a, is definitely a consideration, but they're only as good until your fuel runs out. Uh, and they don't do you any good if you don't have a good quality one and they don't start when you need them. If they sit dormant, if you don't use it, you lose it sometimes. So you want to be aware of that. There's all kinds of solar power options. There's a mobile solar power. There's home-based solar power. There's micro power pack, packable type systems in a backpack, things of that nature we'll talk a little bit more about. A microwave is a really nice item if you want to heat something up quick like a corn bag to take the chill off. If you have a little solar system that even run it, it only takes a couple, three minutes. Uh, not a whole lot of energy. An ozone generator is an absolute amazing tool. Uh, if people are sick in your home and you want to clear the clean the home out, an ozone generator, uh, you can pick one up if you have a little bit of a solar system or some type of a backup power or whatever. You can run that and it'll sterilize the environment in the home. We use this in my pest control company to kill skunk odors and all kinds of things, uh, smoke odors but it also takes out uh, viruses and the bacterial uh, things that may be in the atmosphere, in your fabric, on your clothes. And there's a way to use them. I won't get into that right now, but these are just some ideas. Radio, shortwave, ham radio, two-way radio communications, solar cookers. We're gonna cover a little bit more later on here. 
hand tools, uh, have a mobile checklist of what you'd take if you needed to. And if you have a home-based Berkey water purifier, those are the bigger version of the one I was just showing. The Swiss Catadine is the same thing, same basic thing. Uh, at any rate, and we've already looked at that. So what I'm going to do real quickly is I'm going to cover a few things here. And at the end of each one of these sections, I'm going to ask you guys, uh, let you ask some questions about what we're covering. Uh, when it comes to generators, one of my favorite generators, if you're getting a small generator, is this guy right here. Honda puts out what they call an inverter version of these generators. I've got one of these 2000 watt generators. This is a 2200 watt version. Mine's an older, little older version. It only burns a quarter of a gallon of fuel per hour. They're very good, high quality. They're easy to start and they're quiet. They're very quiet, but they put out a good quality power. Uh, if you get a cheap generator, sometimes I like with this one, if I turn it, put a 120 volt light bulb in it, plug it in, it'll look like a normal light bulb in a house. But I have other generators that if you plug a light bulb into it that are way bigger than this, the light bulb looks like it's half half bright because it has a non-true sine wave output. So even though the voltage is the same, I'm not getting near the amount of power out. And so having an a inverter or a true sine wave or a pure sine wave generator is, if you can, is what I would go for. And these generators are relatively cheap. It's very lightweight, easy to move around. And I can go about four hours with one gallon of fuel fill up in it. Uh, so uh, other things, I'm gonna point a few things out here on the screen and then I'm gonna go through the checklist here real quick. Uh, this here is a, oops, sorry. My, uh, this here is a small solar generator you can throw in a backpack and you can put double AA, A, triple A batteries in them and you can get these. I'm not gonna get into all about how to get them, where to use them, how to use them, any of that kind of stuff right now. I'm just gonna tell you things that I would recommend the thing that's nice about this is if I have a radio, a flashlight, and so forth, uh, as you get into a flashlight, I don't even buy small tools. Have you seen those rechargeable type flashlights that you plug into the wall? They've got a USB charger. Did you know that as soon as the batteries wear out, you can't replace the batteries in those without major hassle? It's almost like they're disposable. But if I get AA or AAA batteries, I can keep my appliance, I can keep my flashlight, but I can charge it using one of these chargers. And this charger here will also charge the batteries up using a USB connection. So this particular charger will charge with solar. Here's a solar panel. Stick the batteries on the inside here and I can stick it outside and it's a slow charger, it's a little panel, but I can also plug this into a USB port and quick charge the batteries. This is one of my favorite lights to plug into a USB port. And if you have a USB battery, backup battery or whatever, or you have a computer, you can plug these in and they're super bright. These ones, the brand, one of the brands I like is called Yeti. It's Y-I-T-E-E. -E. Uh, these are phenomenal and you can order them on eBay and places like that. And if you have a couple, three of these on hand, it's amazing how much light they put out. You just touch the back of them right back here on the, this is the back, oops. This is the back right here. And if you just barely touch the back, your finger warmth automatically turns the light on. You touch it again and it turns it off, but you can get a huge amount of light with a limited amount of power from the battery that you're plugged into. Uh, so if you're getting rechargeable batteries, uh, I get the nickel metal hydride. That's what this stands for here. Nickel metal hydride, double AA, A, triple A. You can get C cell, D cell batteries, but they're a lot more expensive. A lot of solar or a lot of flashlights, radios. I don't even buy one if they don't have double AA, A, triple A battery capability. I don't want to waste my money on it because when the battery dies out after some use and it won't take a charge anymore, my flashlight's worthless. And so I get stuff where I can replace batteries and I can store a lot of the AA, AAA batteries for cheap. I can order those online and, and utilize them that way. Uh, battery maintainers for car batteries, things of that nature can make your batteries last a whole lot longer. I don't have time to get in how this all works, but if I go down to Walmart, you want a pure, 
I mean, you want a fully automatic battery maintainer. You can clip it onto a vehicle that's not being used much. An RV, for example, maybe you have it parked there and one day you go out and yeah, put a brand new battery in here, but it hasn't been charged for six months and now it won't even hardly, it doesn't have hardly any capacity or it, they fail quickly. So if you put a battery maintainer on uh, and you can get a 1.5 amp or a smaller battery maintainer and all they do is keep your battery topped off all the time. Lead acid batteries, which is what your car has, which is what your motorhome has, which is what a lot of home power systems have, except for some of the new batteries coming out. If you don't have a battery maintainer, they will lose a part of their charge every month. And if they're not fully charged all the time, or at least once a month get fully charged, the battery's lifespan significantly shortens. So a maintainer is super cheap. You just plug it into the wall, leave it plugged in all the time. But when you need it, your battery's full charged and it hasn't been wearing out sitting there doing nothing. Uh, and so, at any rate, uh, when it comes to microwave ovens, one of the reasons I like those with a small system like this guy right here, I can plug a microwave oven into this battery system. This is a portable system. Uh, and I'm not gonna get into this very deeply. I'm just giving you some ideas. But if I plug a microwave oven into it, I can boil water in two minutes, uh, two to three minutes, a cup of water. And in an emergency, if I wanna fill up a, a water bottle, or something of that nature and, and throw it in my sleeping bag because I'm freezing to death kind of thing, or I have a child that's losing body temperature. Uh, what a great way to quick, quickly do something. Ozone generator is one of my favorite power tools to have for sterilizing or sanitizing the uh, a room or whatever. Uh, I used to do that. Uh, motels use them sometimes. Uh, convection ovens, you can do a lot quickly with that with a limited amount of power. Refrigerators and freezers, I just want to make a comment. That's like heating in reverse. Refrigerators and freezers use a huge amount of energy. And what I did, I went down and I bought, for my freezer that's out in the garage, I bought one-inch foil-faced foam board that uh, reflected radiant energy. And even if I didn't have that, I'd put regular hard foam board on it and you seal the top on the lid uh, and so forth. And my freezer literally uses half the power. It just makes the insulation so much better. Do not cover the part of the freezer that has a compressor on it or you'll be trapping heat in there. You only do it on the sides where there's no heat or that can be uh, trapped inside. So I do it on my back of my freezer because my vent and my uh, cooling fan and so forth for my freezer is on the left side. So I've got insulation on the top, front, back, and right as an example. Uh, real quickly, I don't have time to get into a lot of this. There's a lot of fuels here and there's fire starter methods. And right over here, candles can be used for fuel. Uh, canned heat you can use in an emergency. Uh, charcoal. Uh, Charcoal is more of a hassle. It's great as long as you've got it. When you run out of these fuels, you got nothing. Uh, cooking oil, lamp oil, newspapers, firewood, all these things can be stored. They can be stored long-term. And if you have a light or a lamp or you can use cooking oil and so forth, I'll get more into that here in a few minutes. It's nice to have this kind of stuff on hand. However, uh, if you don't have it, there's all kinds of other things we can do, but these are just some energy sources and they're temporary because when you've used them up, uh, you don't have anything left, uh, then you're done. Firewood is a renewable source. I really like firewood and there's very few places where you can't get wood or twigs or sticks or brush or something in, in the United States in some place. And so rocket stoves are great because you can use those uh, like the one that's shown right here. Oops, sorry about that. This rocket stove right here has a deal. This On this one, you have a lid that flips up and you can put a pot on there. You can boil water, you can fry a steak. Uh, you can superheat real quickly uh, a rock or a brick or something like that, or water to stick in a water bottle or whatever, a canteen, so you can put it in a sleeping bag if you're chilled and you want to warm up quickly. Uh, right down here is an air vent. 
And when you start the fire, I start by dropping things down through the top. Uh, I start feeding the twigs in this little slot right here. And then down here on the bottom is your air vent. You don't put anything in there. And as you feed the twigs about every five to 10 minutes, it'll keep the fire going. And you can use twigs, pine cones, there's all kinds of things you can use. And, uh, but it's a phenomenal tool. Uh, if the pioneers would have had those, what a difference that would make. You know what I like about these? Uh, in hard times, you're not using hardly any fuel because it's, it's very uh, super efficient burn rate. The air is being directed at the fire and the fire is going straight up to what your cooking surface that you're going to have uh, on the top here and your pan or whatever. Uh, so it's a great resource. But the other thing I like is that during the daytime at nighttime, because they're so efficient, they don't give off much smoke once they get going. So you don't give yourself away. Uh, they don't have much bright light. You're not wasting a huge amount of fuel running a wood fire on the outdoor area and so forth. So they're super efficient. Gasoline, kerosene, diesel, white gas, propane are all fuels that can be used in generators, vehicles, lights, uh, lamps, things of that nature. I'm gonna get into this more in a minute here. Uh, and there's different types of starters. One of my favorite things is to use a, the sunlight using the uh, magnifying glass. And I'll get more into that here in a few minutes. Uh, matches, lighters are great to have on hand. Flint and steel, bow and drill if you're out in the wilderness and you've got a piece of string or rope or you can make something. I've literally started fires with no matches, no anything, just using wood, uh, a knife, and I set up a bow and drill type thing and I started using friction to start a fire. Uh, propane torch is a real quick, simple way to start something, but I don't like wasting fuel, so it's only just to get something started typically. Uh, battery sparkers, I can take the 12 volt battery on a car, for example, put a piece of wire across it, just strike it negative to positive, and I could create a spark and start a fire or uh, get some tinder smoldering, and then I can blow it into a flame. Uh, fuel stabilizers. These are really important if you're storing gasoline, diesel uh, type fuels, and you add a fuel stabilizer like Stable is a brand name. Uh, if you add the stabilizer to your fuel, it'll make your fuels last 18 to 24 months. Uh, anybody, I had an aircraft one day and I had it sitting, uh, sitting for a year and a half and I went out one day and I couldn't get it to start. And I smelled the fuel tank and it smelled like kerosene. I mean, it, it smelled like varnish. I went, what in the world? Who put varnish in my tank? I didn't realize that the fuels break down and they corrode. So if you use a stabilizer and you're storing gasoline for your vehicles or uh, diesel for a vehicle or whatever, that's a great way to extend it. Gasoline and diesel, just so you know, are uh, if you're using it in a vehicle, stabilizers are essential. If you're going to use diesel it's, that stinks and it doesn't work like it used to, you can still use it for lighting and for cooking and things of that nature. Uh, here's some lights. Again, we talked about batteries, nickel metal hydride, double AA, A, triple A is my favorite. This flashlight holds three triple A batteries. This flashlight holds uh, some double A batteries. Uh, so these are different sources of light. I love these types of lamps. They're windproof. You can take them outside. I could use diesel fuel. I can use used motor oil almost in here. It may smoke a little bit, but I still get light out of it. You can use candles. Uh, you can use kerosene. It's really nice, clean fuel. But if I have to, I put diesel in there and I'll burn my lamps off that. And I turn the wick down enough to where it doesn't smoke. You can take a can of Crisco. You can take uh, cooking oil, like here's olive oil or uh, any type of oil you use for cooking. You can put a little wick in here. And if you can get it to stand straight up, you can literally turn that into light. And you can take the chill off of a little tent room or a a tent or whatever. This over here is one of my favorite tools. It's a hand crank generator, but some of them also have solar panels on the top. So I can hand crank that. And if I have no power whatsoever, especially if it's got double AA, A, triple A batteries in it, that's the type I would look for where I can replace them. I can hand crank that and then listen to the radio. I have a flashlight on the front end here. And if it's solar powered and you've got the hand crank and you've got the batteries and it has a USB charger, 
you can plug into it, then what a cool little tool to have. And make sure that your light bulbs are LED. I don't like halogen. I mean, I love them, but they drain battery fast because they use a lot of power. They're not very efficient. They give off a lot of heat. LEDs are by far the most efficient light bulbs, and they make your batteries go much farther between charges. So I'm talking fast because I've got a lot to cover here, but you guys can take the, this program. You can go back, look at this stuff, and drill down and see some of what I said on there. I love headlights. I can put them on my head, and when I'm working, it's out of the way, and my eyes are looking right where the light's shining, and it makes it so easy. They're so nice. This here is a solar yard light. You can get them for a few dollars at Walmart or places like that. There's a solar panel on the top. They're not the best in the world. They have a, but they'll last for a couple, three, four, or five hours at nighttime. And they use AA, AAA batteries. And if they don't use AA, AAA batteries for their battery in there, I won't buy them. So make sure it's got AA, AAA, because when the batteries go bad, sometimes they don't even last a year being out in the yard. And then, hey, my light's not working. It's because the batteries quit working because they wore out. They weren't very good quality. So have AA, AAAs on hand, and you can replace them. And that's a, oops, sorry about that. That's a great little tool to just have in storage if somebody doesn't have any budget at all. I think I went down to Walmart, and you can buy them for less than $5 a piece. Uh, here's other ways to use solar power. These are all things that I've done. This is I've, I've put together a parabolic dish. I wrapped it with a mylar reflective material. And in 10 seconds, I can start a stick on fire pointing it directly at the sun. Uh, or I can get it smoking and it'll burst into flames if it's bright sunlight, especially as it gets to noon where you have more energy. This is a solar oven. I took this one day up to BYU, Idaho, Rick's College at the time, and I was baking a loaf of bread in the main quad and the students are walking around smelling fresh bread baking, but they didn't realize the bread, they walked right past it. It was sunlight baking the bread. This particular oven that I have is not available anymore, but they have other solar ovens. This is just an example, but I pop this lid off. I put the loaf of bread on this rack here and I can literally bake a loaf of one loaf of bread almost as fast in this at the middle of the day when the sun's out as I can in the oven in my house. Uh, this is a solar greenhouse that I have. I'll show you more pictures here later on. This is April. We have snow on the ground. I'll show you pictures on that. This is another little greenhouse I just made using uh, clear plastic uh, siding that I got from Wall or Home Depot. I put this together. Over here, our, our lat we only have a 91-day growing season in St. Anthony where I'm at. And uh, 91 days, meaning the last frost is about June 6th average. Our first frost is September 6th. So we only have 91 days average of uh, no freezing. I planted my tomatoes out here in February when it got down to five below zero. And I, I, I'm not going to get into how I do this right now, but I'm just giving you some ideas. And I was picking the vine ripened tomatoes for eight months clear almost at Christmas time with no heat whatsoever, no lights, no heat, no anything. I have a door on this end, door on the other end. I open the doors and I can cross ventilate. In an emergency in the winter time, I can go in here when it's 10 below zero outside with the doors shut and it'll be 80 to 100 degrees in here because it absorbs the sunlight and it heats up the inside of this little house. It's a great place to warm up a warming shack, so to speak. Here's a solar box cooker, which I built. And I can tell you some really cool stories. I'm not going to get into it all right now because I don't have time. Uh, on a home system, if you buy a traditional home system and you put solar on your house, did you know that most solar systems on houses quit when the power goes out? If the power company goes down by code, they have to quit to protect the line run from getting electrocuted. This particular system is one that I put in it has solar panels and wind power to generate power. You have to have a way to store power for nighttime and during low light conditions, or when you need extra power to run high, heavy loads and you're not getting enough from sunlight. So you, this is your storage system. And this over here is a system that converts it to 120, 240 volts in your house. So here's a way to generate power, a way to store power, and a way to convert power to the voltages and your outlets in your home or 
whatever that you're going to be running. So this is a, the elements of a, of, of a system. In a regular home system that power companies are putting into homes, they have solar panels and they have an inverter that connects them directly to the power grid. And I'm not going to explain how it all works. It's very, there's a lot to it, but that's all they have. So when the power goes out or at nighttime, if, there, if the power company's power goes out, your solar does you absolutely no good because you don't have a way to store it and manage it without the battery. So you have to have batteries. So if you go to get one for your house, if it doesn't have batteries on it, uh, it costs more, but it's worth its weight in gold when the time comes. Uh, here's a motor home that we lived in for two years, 27 below zero. Uh, I put in a little wood burning stove. I didn't cut a single hole in it. I had a little stove that we, we had built little tiny one that has 15 inch box. It's not much, you, you can stick a carton of eggs in there, uh, size wise, uh, 18 egg carton in there and have a little space on the sides and it's about that deep on the inside. The chimney vented out and so we were heating the inside of this thing and it was 80 degrees warm. It took two little banker boxes full of chopped up firewood to heat that thing at 24 seven. And uh, so it was very comfortable and I would, I'd fry bacon on the stove. You can see how little the stove is. It's amazing what they can do. At any rate, there's all kinds of stoves you can get as a way to heat. Uh, I'm gonna get into a few other things. You guys have already had classes on this, so I'm not gonna say much. This is one of my favorite tools is a thermal cooker. Uh, and if you buy thermoses and you wanna save your heat that you generate from however you heat your water. Uh, at nighttime, when the sun goes down, and if, uh, I'll explain more of this here in a minute, but the this is a vacuum insulated device. I won't even buy a thermos. I won't buy a solar cooker. I mean, a thermal cooker, unless it's a vacuum evacuated or vacuum insulated is what they call it the wall on this thing here is less than a quarter of an inch thick and it's way better insulation than one inch thick insulation I have on a thermos. It's stunning how well, because air conducts heat, but when you suck the air out between the inside layer and the outside layer of your, your thermos, it can't conduct heat. So your heat loss is right around the lid mainly and up here on this part, because that's not vacuum. So make sure when you get a thermos, it's vacuum. Uh, I had a regular thermos, went snow skiing. I had one that was vacuum thermos, uh, same size. I came out and I took a drink out of the one that was normal, hot chocolate. It was five degrees below zero when we came back from skiing, night skiing. Uh, when I got done, it was like cold, cold, hot chocolate. And I was going, That's, that was sad. And then I took the lid off the uh, one that had a vacuum uh, insulation on it, and I burned my mouth almost. I was shocked at the difference between the two. So make sure it's vacuum, and that's a trick. That's something I, I don't even waste my money. And most of them these days are starting to get that way. You can make your own solar box cookers, uh, and I'm just going to brief through this real quickly. You can buy commercial ones that are available. And if you guys have questions later on, you want more information on this, I can post a few things that'll give you some ideas on what to do, but I can take a small cardboard box. Oops, sorry. I can take a small cardboard box, put it inside of a big cardboard box, wrap up newspapers, wad them up, stick them in between to create a little bit of insulation, tape the joints together, put a little lid on top that I can lift up or take off, and then put a little hinge, put tin foil on this, and I can reflect extra heat in here. I can literally boil water with sunlight in that box with no firewood, no anything. Every day the sun comes out, you've got free energy. I love solar cooking. Here's one that I made. Uh, I don't have time to get into it, but I will tell you that I, I went out and I can boil water when it's 10 below zero uh, with this, with sunlight and just absolutely amazing. Uh, you can cook with these things. You can bake with them. You can boil water uh, and you can, steam things, you can uh, warm foods, you can dehydrate, you can pasteurize, you can sterilize things. Let's say that you have toilet paper, you run out and you have pieces of cloth uh, 
that you can uh, use for toilet paper, like we used to in the old days, you rinse it out in a bucket of water, and then I want to kill the bacteria and everything. If I had a solar box cooker, I can literally carefully put it in there, and I can literally sterilize it and kill every bit of the bacteria, even if I have no soap, no anything like that. If I wash it out first, stick it in there. There's cool things you can do with them. I can warm up uh, rocks or stones or whatever, stick it in my sleeping bag. I can warm up water, fill up a water bottle or a canteen and stick it in my sleeping bag uh, to warm myself up without ever starting a fire in the middle of the winter. And uh, so I'm going to skip through this stuff. Uh, the cardboard box cooker, you can get temperatures up to 250 degrees. That'll water boils at 212 at sea level. Uh, so you can pasteurize and ster sterilize basically all kinds of things with these. So if you don't even have the tools, now you got some cardboard, tin foil, a piece of plastic or a piece of glass or something you can put over the top of the uh, solar box cooker and tape. Here's one made out of a pizza box and people are baking cookies in there. And the sunlight will get this box up to like 140 degrees on a good sunny day, maybe a little bit more, maybe up to 160 by adding extra reflection here and, and reflecting and angling that lid to where it points the light directly inside the box here. I can get the temperatures up to 250 degrees, which will sterilize, pasteurize, uh, do all kinds of things. And here's just some little ideas, and I'm gonna skip past this. Uh, you can also roast hot dogs inside these things. It's, I mean, it's amazing what you can do when you start practicing, and that's using a pizza box and just things you might have at home. And here's some instructions that show you a simple way to do this. And I'm not gonna get into this right now, but here's a reference. Uh, here's how to build one, some instructions. I'm gonna skip past this. And it shows you how to build a reflector that amplifies light or adds more light into the box so it makes it hotter. Uh, I was doing all kinds of tests in the middle of the winter time. I'm out cooking and I could tell you some real cool stories, but I, I'm not gonna get into that right now. So when it comes to fuel, heat, energy, there's all kinds of things I can do with sunlight. Even if I can't walk into a greenhouse, it's nice and warm uh, or, or whatever, I can still heat up rocks and bricks and water and things of that nature in here and then use that in my sleeping bag or stick it inside my coat and uh, so forth. Okay, I'm gonna get into first aid. I'm gonna stop real quick. How much, let's see what time it is. I don't wanna go over time. About 6.30, still an hour. Okay, uh, anybody have any questions uh, real quickly for about five minutes on any of that? Feel free to unmute or put it in the chat. And I'll see if I can see. Okay, um, this is Carolyn and I do have a question. Um, I think on these generators, don't they have to be uh, outside? So, you know, when you're running them? Very good. Yes. You want your generator outside for a number of reasons. You don't want to vent carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide into a space and uh, asphyxiate yourself. Uh, the other thing, too, is when you get fuels inside of a tight space and you have gasoline in there and you're giving off that type of fuel, if it gets built up, you could create an explosive hazard. So you want an extension cord that goes outside or whatever if you're going to use that type of a generator. Another thing you can do is put in a multi-breaker transfer switch, which I don't have time to get into all the things that you can do, but you can put that in and plug it into a few breakers in your house, have an electrician put it in so that you can plug a generator in from outside. And let's say that I had uh, I'll show you some pictures here in a few minutes. Okay, thank you. But yeah, there's there's all kinds of options. Keep it outside. And I have a dumb question. There, there's no dumb questions. <laughs> so, you know, I'm thinking worst case scenario here where um, there's no electricity, uh, we're, you know, planting and, and, and all those different things. So how would one go about, let's say, um, making sure that they can keep maybe food items cold. Um, can you still use the solar energy to do that? Or I'm just uh, curious. You, the, only, the only way you can really do that is if you have a generator, a solar jet power generator, and then you create electricity to run a uh, 
refrigerator, freezer, or some type of a device that where, where you can make ice cubes and stick them in a container or whatever to keep stuff cool. Quite frankly, I'm just going to be honest with you. I've, do, I've done this for decades, installing systems. I tell people, if you have to rely, refrigerator and freezers are only good until your food's gone. And if you want to use it in hard times, you need to have a, a good size system to be able to charge enough batteries to keep your freezer and your refrigerator going. Uh, I could go on for an hour or two explaining all this. Here's the bottom line. If I get into hard times with everything we've got, and if I don't have a big enough solar system, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the food out of my freezer and cook it or, uh, and then uh, maybe dehydrate it or whatever so I can keep it in jerky form or whatever long-term. I'm going to use it up quickly and I don't want to waste my power that way unless I have a good sized solar system that can run it and keep it going day by day. Uh, most people, you remember that little box I showed you that had the solar panels on it? There's people buying those and they advertise them and they say, yeah, this will run your refrigerator. Sure, well, for about 15 minutes or maybe an hour uh, or two or three. And then when the battery's dead, it could take days for that solar panel to charge that battery back up because it just, that the battery, it takes a huge amount of energy. So my thought is get away from refrigeration if you can help it and start learning how to preserve with dehydration, uh, things of that nature or cooking uh, things. Anyway. Hey Dave, this is Lee Gasper Galvin. I was just wondering um, on your batteries that you use to store solar and wind energy at your house, what chemistry, battery chemistry are those and, and what brand are they? I've, I've used lead acid like Trojan or uh, there's there's a few of them that are out there, and I and I can answer more of this stuff uh, in email questions uh, later on here. But uh, I used lead acid. They've now got uh, lithium ion, and it's a new technology that's just amazing. But it's more fickle when it comes to cold, and so you have to handle your batteries more effectively. The bad thing about the lead acid batteries is you have to add water almost on a monthly, every, every two month basis, you have to add uh, distilled water. So I have a little distiller that I can make water if I have to long-term. Yeah, unless you have AGM batteries, you wouldn't have to add water to those. Here's the problem with AGM batteries. Typically they cost twice as much and they la have half the lifespan. They don't have as many cycles. They don't ah. last long, they wear out. Okay. And so you can use that and that's great. You don't have to add water. So they're low maintenance, but they have a shorter lifespan. I've tested them over the years. And just in general, most of my experience is they last half. If I can get a good quality lead acid battery to last me seven or eight years under normal use, if I'm using it at the right levels each day. Uh, and I had a, a gel cell sealed battery. I might get three, four years out of it. The other one, I get seven, eight years. And the, the sealed batteries typically cost more than mm -hmm. the batteries where you have to add water. So those are some nuances, just so you know. Thank you very much. Your, your bet. And so Go ahead. each one of these things we're talking about could be a class. I could do a class on solar systems, just spend one hour doing nothing but solar or, or two hours and give you information to really help out on a strong level. But you're going to get batteries. Uh, lead acid, a deep cycle lead acid, renewable energy deep cycle, because the cheap deep cycle stuff they put in boats that you get at an auto parts store, they don't have very many cycles. They don't, they last one quarter of the length of a good renewable energy home battery, just so you know. Yeah, I, I did a conversion of a Ford Ranger pickup with those and, and they only lasted one to two years yep. and they were dead. <laughs> yep. That, that's why I like to tell people, I like to give them this information up front because you can, you put all this money into a system and if you don't put the right parts in it or you don't understand the batteries, you, you'll never forget your lesson at the end of the year when the batteries fail and you have to go out and buy a brand new set. And in a home system, they were running three to $6,000 just for the batteries. And if you have to replace them after one year mm. to do that, so, or two years. So what I do is I get, much better grade. And then there's tricks to making them last much longer. Additives you can put in the batteries, like a thing called battery equalizer. I, I just happen to have it sitting here. It's a liquid I can add to lead acid batteries and it can extend the life out 50% of the battery's normal lifespan or more. 
Well, I appreciate that. Let me go ahead and get into the health end of things. I've got a ton of information here. I'm gonna go through this very quickly. Oops, let's see if I can. And I'm not gonna spend much time on these slides. You can read these later on when you go through this, but just what to store for in a medical emergency, learn herbal and other remedies that can be used in an emergency. And if you go into the scriptures, they talk about using herbs with skill. There's ways you can use them for health, for uh, food, for uh, medicinal purposes, things of that nature and then some basics on emergency dentistry. Uh, essential oils are phenomenal. They're the essence of what you get out of a lot of these uh, great herbs right here, uh, or these plants. You can get these essential oils. A lot of them will store for years. They're super concentrated. And I recommend, I'm not gonna get into it, but all these have some powerful capabilities. Each one, some of them are, uh, uh, can be used kind of for antibiotic purposes. Some of them can be, there's so many different uses in a medicinal level. And so with that, and, and so what's nice about the book that Michelle put out, the one that we talked about in the beginning, uh, she's got some basic uses and so forth, but I recommend getting an in-depth book on how to use essential oils. And some stuff's a bunch of conjecture. Uh, people kind of take guesses at it, but I would find some that are really good quality information that they have in there. Put it on your shelf. And then when the time comes, holy mackerel, I've got a, a respiratory infection. I, I'm having a hard time breathing. One of my favorites is On Guard blend that doTERRA puts out. There's all kinds of stuff that you can use out there, but you can't use what you don't know. And even if you have all this stuff, what would you use if you have congestion and you need to open up your sinuses? Or if you want something that's an an antibiotic tendencies or whatever like that. Uh, if you learn, if you have that reference, and by the way, the reason I say book, and I'm gonna push books big time, because if the power goes out and you have no electricity and your cell phone doesn't work and you can't get online and you can't look things up anymore, uh, what are you gonna do? Where do you get your information? It's gone, unless you've got it written down somewhere. So have books to back up how to use essential oils. Another thing is when it comes to medicinal herbs at home or in the wild, here's a great book uh, on medicinal herbs. And I would go down this time of the year and uh, get certain types of plants. Like uh, right now I've got rosemary and I've got that in my greenhouse. And it's a kind of like a woody plant. What's cool about it is I can go out, clip the leaves out, I can dry them. I can extract essential oils from it if I have a little, uh, and I don't have time to get into this today, but I can take a pressure cooker with a little hose that comes off that, run it through a little copper coil into a pool of cool water, and I can literally make my own essential oils if I wanted essential oils. If not, I can dry the leaves and I can turn around and use those leaves as an er a dried herb instead of an oil and I can get a lot of the goodness that way. This talk, oh, the reason I like this book or books like this is because it shows you which herbs you can use. It shows you how to prepare them, how to grow them and so forth. Again, the books are a gold mine. This is mint, this is dandelions. They have medicinal properties. This is rosemary. This is mullen. You can pick the leaves off of it and use it for toilet paper if you wanted to. They also have medicinal properties, calendula, uh, sage. Uh, there, there's just so many things that you can do and you can grow this in your yard or in the greenhouse or in the window in your house. If you are in an apartment, there's certain herbs that you can grow that give you medicinal properties uh, that you can use in hard times. Get a book like this one here and then learn the different uses for each one of these herbs, and this is just part of the medicinal herbs. So there's medicinal herbs, there's culinary herbs for flavoring foods and so forth. I love lemon verbena, you know, there's all kinds of stuff you can use. But what I highly recommend, it's not just what you can grow that doesn't normally grow there. Mullen grows wild around here. Learn what your local wild edibles are. Learn what your local medicinal 
herbs are that you can pick, like dandelions grow almost everywhere in the United States. And so if you learn that you can use these for food and you can use them for medicinal purposes and so forth, what are those purposes? How can I use them? Get a book on it and then learn how to identify these things. So there's things that grow in the wild and there's things that you can grow at home that aren't in the wild, or maybe they're in the wild, but you, I just want to have it on my home. Start an herbal garden. And if a lot of it's perennials where they grow year after year, they come back, fantastic. Now you have those. And if you need to, you can go out and in the fall before the wintertime comes when the tops die out, I can pick the leaves off the tops and dry them. Uh, and one of the things I love doing is cayenne pepper. Uh, we grow just cayenne pepper and then we store the peppers, crunch them up, and man, they're so hot. It, it's amazing what you can do with them. But you can do that. Cayenne peppers are phenomenal for people that are having heart problems. Uh, they're at risk of a heart attack and they're starting to have symptoms or whatever. There's ways that you can use it. Uh, you can't use what you don't know. You can't use what you don't have. I would get these books or something like it while they're available. Have it on hand, brief through it. And in an emergency, long-term time frame, you can go through and start learning what's available locally to you if you haven't planted anything, what's in the wild. Or if you've planted it, you can intentionally plant things that are going to give you a great capability. So just wanted to mention that. I'm not going to get into first aid supplies and things of that nature very much right now, other than uh, it's, it's uh, Michelle's got that in her book, so I'm going to let you reference that because there's some other things I want to get into here. But when it comes to first aid supplies, first aid books are essential. And if you can get cert trained or whatever, which a lot of times you don't even have to pay for the classes, but if you get trained on how to do emergency first aid, uh, somebody's having a heart attack, they're having uh, uh, some kind of an asthma attack or whatever, it's nice to be able to brief real quickly into these materials and find out what to do. Uh, another thing I like putting in storage, which is surgical tools. If you need to suture up somebody or something like that, and you have sutures and curved needles, and you've got uh, little pliers or whatever, uh, razors to help clean things up and uh, get them sewed together, fantastic. But I'd have first aid tools, typical, uh, like gauze, cutting gauze or whatever using scissors, but surgical tools are a little bit more advanced and you can get really nice sets on eBay or places like that for $75 to have that in storage. And then have a book that helps you to understand how to use these things. Uh, aspirin is a phenomenal thing to have on hand uh, if somebody's having heart issues. We had somebody that in our family just barely had a stroke this last week, and they told him if he hadn't been taking aspirin, he would have been way worse off uh, and possibly may not have made it to the hospital. Uh, things that Benadryl type compounds. And I'm not going to say much about this right now, but this is my number one thing that I like having in storage, hydrogen peroxide. You can use it to clean things, to sterilize things. You can use it as an antiseptic to topically clean wounds and things of that nature. It's phenomenal. All it is is water with an extra oxygen atom. It's H2O2. Instead of H2O, it's H2O2. It's one of the most powerful antibiotics I've read. And I, uh, at any rate, if you want more information, you can get it from, uh, uh, when we get done here, I'll show, tell you how you can get that, but there's some real powerful stuff. And I recommend one to two gallons of the brown bottle, 3% in storage for every person in the house and then learn the different uses of it because it, it could be, it could make a major difference, life saving difference. Uh, baking soda is a great thing. Coconut oil is phenomenal. Uh, I don't have time to get into all the reasons why all this stuff is important or good, but this is just a partial list, but these are some of the things that I really uh, focus on. There's emergency care, which gets you to the hospital. But if we don't have a hospital or if somebody's got acute problems, which are very sharp, short term or chronic, which is long term nagging pain and stuff like or things of that nature, there's different approaches to medicines and how to use herbs and how to use all these different types of tools and so forth. Uh, 
activated charcoal. There's different ways that you can use that to, I won't get into it right now. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time, but these are just some ideas and some reasons why I do it. But this one right here is one of my top of my list type things. And all the rest of it's important too. When it gets into dental, uh, there's things in nature, like if you go out uh, near a watery area and you can find horsetail, this is mature horsetail. It's snap grass is another name for it. It has a high silica content. And when you break it off, you can chew on it and it'll clean your teeth up, but it's very abrasive. It's like sand, but it's, it's, it's okay. Just don't want to do it too long. Uh, there's all kinds of other uses for it. And uh, this is great on a dental level. Uh, you can take a twig like this one right down here. You can fray the end of it and use it kind of like a toothbrush if you don't have one in nature. And if you've got baking soda, oh my goodness, that's one of my favorite cheap materials. I can go down to Costco or Sam's Club or whatever and for $8 buy 15 pound bag of this stuff and it'll last forever. Uh, so have this kind of stuff on hand and then learn the uses for it. Uh, another thing is when you get between your teeth, a lot of rot happens between your teeth. And if people don't have floss, they don't have a way to get in between your teeth. Uh, one thing I want to mention on dental, do your dental work, keep it up to date all the time. If you don't keep it up to date, and you've got a tooth that's going bad. And then all of a sudden we get cut off from resources. And we can't get to a dentist uh, for whatever reason. Now we're in big trouble. And people that get tooth problems and have issues that way, that can impact your whole health. And there, it's a major cause of issues when people can't get access to help. It makes them sick. They're in bed. They get chills. There's all kinds of things that can happen. Again, your mouthwash, hydrogen peroxide kills bacteria. I'm sorry about that. It kills bacteria. It kills viruses, a lot of viruses. And when you swish with it, uh, you can spit it out. But there's a way that you can drink it, but you can't drink it straight. And I'm not going to get into that. That's in that uh, handout I think Heidi's got. At any rate, it's a power tool. The minty oil, mouthwash, salt water, the gargles, mouthwashes, colloidal silver. Uh, oh, I wish I had time to get into all this stuff. Colloidal silver, I can take a 12-volt car battery, go down to a jeweler, get two little sticks of silver, hook it up or hook, hook two batteries in uh, series, make it 24 volts instead of 12 volts, and I can make my own colloidal silver. And I don't have time to get into it. It's cheap, but in a, uh, any rate, there's power, powerful things you can do with that. And when you take it, uh, it also kills bacteria. Uh, and we talked about horsetail. You can dry it, powder it, chew on it fresh. It's very abrasive, so don't overuse it. And I'm sorry, I didn't have more time to get into it. Uh, Michelle's book is so much more detailed. Uh, but I just wanted to, does anybody have any questions right now? You keep saying Michelle's book. I'm not sure what the, which book you're re referencing there. She's got all kinds of information regarding what to store. Uh, she has more information on essential oils. There's a lot in here on the health end of it. And instead of replicating that, I recommend that you get that and use that as a reference tool and have it in your library. What, or, is the name of, what is the name of the book? It's called Be Prepared, Not Scared. And in the beginning of this slide. Okay. okay. So that's what I would use. Now, okay. what I'm going to do is I'm going to get into something very quickly here. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't have. Well, you get that ready. Let me just explain. Um, Michelle Jorgensen's book, she was the very first speaker on our first class. And she taught the first four chapters of her book. And then her book is 12 Steps on How to Get to Be Prepared and What to Do First. I took those 12 chapters, broke them into our classes. And so Michelle herself taught the first four chapters. And we had Katie teach the next couple chapters. And then we had Cindy teach the next, and now Dave is teaching all these sections on that chapter. So that's why he's relating to that. And then communication is the last chapter, which will be in two weeks. So it's kind of based on that book. And as Dave said, it's packed full of information. Thank you. 
I, I, I have to tell you, I could literally spend hours on every single individual topic in here. I don't have the time and we only have two hours, but I want to give you an overview of what's possible. Right now, I'm going to cover something very rapidly. I don't have time to get into it. My wife's a certified health coach, a live blood analysis, microscope, all kinds of stuff. What an amazing system. We have a program we put together over the years that has just been stunning. Most people that come in that say they're sick or they're, I've got health problems. Uh, my comment kind of is under my breath. No, you don't. That's a symptom of a habit or something you did that got you here. We're always chasing symptoms. We're never focusing on the problem, actual problems. If people changed their habits and they, and what I'm going to show you very rapidly, I don't have time to get into it. I'm just referencing it and the slides are here, but there's a whole bunch more on how to use it effectively. This is based on word of wisdom, flat out, wonderful information. And I'm going to go through here very quickly. Uh, and again, uh, if you have issues, health issues or whatever, uh, disclaimer, the following information is for informational purposes only. Uh, go out, study it, and discern it yourself. But my experience on my end has just been phenomenal. And I could go through and tell you story after story. I'm going to show you a couple of pictures here in a minute. So uh, in hard times or coming up to more difficult possible challenges, always be at your peak strength, endurance, and acuity, mental clarity, the ability to think. Health is a condition of being sound in mind, body, and spirit. It's a condition of the body. It means being free from weakness, infirmities, disease, or pain. And uh, here's, here's my blood. This was years ago, a few years ago. This is not even normal. See how this is all chained together? And there's not a round cell in here. Oops, sorry. Not a round cell in here. I was dehydrated. I was eating too many calories, not not uh, carbohydrates per se, just flat out calorie overload. I had serious dehydration and I had toxins present. And when it's chaining together, it's I'm not getting enough water. And uh, this is 24 hours later after a 24 hour fast, rehydration, eight hours of sleep. What a night and day difference. There's pictures and if I didn't have a microscope, we would never have seen this. Uh, doctor's office probably wouldn't have taken the time to show us this here. It, it's way better. Anyway, there's a first class example of how you can change things if you understand what I'm going to share with you right now. Here's what we call an eight point quick start. When individuals experience health problems, they almost always are out of balance in one or more of the following eight points of self-reliant health that I'm going to share with you right now. Here's a little tool. This is only part of it. There's four pages. This is the front page. Uh, where are you at right now? How much water are you drinking? Uh, most people do not drink enough water and they drink milk, they drink juices, they drink diuretics like coffee, tea, alcohol. They drink uh, carbonated beverages. Oh my goodness, what a disaster that can be on sucking the moisture out of your body at the cellular level. So they drink all this and your body will try and get water and moisture from where it can, but it, it struggles big time. And there's whole books out on this. Uh, one of my favorite books is You're Not Sick, You're Thirsty. Uh, another one the author put out later on is called Your Body's Many Cries for Water. This is one of the first things I like asking people, how much water are you actually drinking daily? It's half your body weight in ounces. If you didn't do anything, but you took this side over here, and you just start balancing yourself more. 80-20 diet, 80% alkaline foods, and it gives you a list of the types of things to avoid and things to use. Drink half your body weight in ounces if you weigh 200 pounds. Half your body weight in ounces is 100 ounces. 100 ounces divided by uh, 32 ounces in a quart, that's just a tad over three quarters of a gallon of water a day, uh, and so forth. How many people are doing that? And I don't want to drink that kind of a thing. Well, okay, then you suffer the consequences later on. Avoid toxins. Uh, and I'm not going to get into this very much. I'm just giving you an overview. Toxins are added sugars, white sugar, brown sugar. Those are all toxic. Uh, and they give us energy, but they weaken our system in other ways and they can change the, and I won't get into it right now. 
but it's just stunning. And then a lot of products that we put on, lotions, cleaners, solvents, deodorants, cosmetic, they've got all kinds of chemicals that are absorbed through the skin and they can build up over time. Uh, seven to nine hours of sleep, uh, good quality sleep, aerobic exercise. I've got a little exercise routine that I go through and it takes me three minutes to eight minutes and I've monitored with live, live blood analysis. I've done uh, pulse oximeter, uh, glucometer, all kinds of things, uh, blood pressure, all kinds of things. And it's stunning to track this. We've got some tools that help you to see what's really going on and watch the changes take place in your system to push you in a more healthy mode. Uh, purpose, uh, attitudes, uh, people can have attitude issues. Uh, if somebody gets stressed out, did you know you can hit, see, smell, and hear stress? Have you ever had some news that came that was so bad that your stomach started churning and you could hear your stomach gurgling? That's instantaneously going acidic. Uh, you can smell it. Your body odor changes when you're stressed. Uh, you can see stress in people's countenances. Attitudes are a choice. And if we learn how to manage and uh, so I, I don't have time to get into all this. This is a really cool, simple, simple approach. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So uh, again, diet, 80-20 diet. This is just basic, very simple. Eat meat sparingly, non-GMO, organic focused. And I, and I don't have time to get into how to do this, but whole grains, fruits, vegetables, more alkaline foods are in that line. And there's charts out on alkaline foods. Another thing is water, half your body weight in ounces. We talked about that, so I'm gonna skip this real quickly. Uh, toxins, artificial sweeteners, big time. Uh, it taxes damage, parasites in people. Oh my, I, I could go on for hours on some of these things, but very simply minimize the toxins in your diet. Artificial sweeteners, aspartame, phenylalanine, sulfame K, sucralose, uh, not sucrose, sucrose is sugar, sucralose is artificial, big time. Uh, at any rate, I don't have time to get into this, but here's a quick checklist of things to consider. There's more to this. Uh, aerobic exercises, and I'm not going to get into that uh, too much. Oxygen is the body's cleaner, and if we're not getting oxygen deep into our cellular structure and so forth through oxygenation, aerobic exercise, and there's a way to stage into it if we're older, or we have heart problems or things of that nature, be very careful. But if we're, uh, at any rate, so that's important. And we talked about sleep, stress, I'm gonna skip past most of this. Uh, and uh, these slides will explain this when you go through and look at them later on here. Uh, another thing I wanted to do very quickly, here's something that we put together. We have relief societies and we had, uh, county organizations like search and rescue groups take these things and they'll put one of these together. It's a full day food supply, fire starter, toilet paper, first aid. It's got a little bit of first aid, mending kit, a poncho. I can make a solar still in here and out in the desert. I can get water out in the desert using this leaf bag. Uh, there's instructions. Uh, it tells you on the back of these instructions, which I'll show you some pictures here. Here's what's in it, toilet paper, all these Ziploc baggies, I can use those out in the field. If I, if I collect water and I have to carry water and I don't have a canteen, or if I want to store dry fire starter so I can start a fire at night uh, easier, whatever the case may be. Uh, hard grains, uh, oh, I don't even have time to get into this, but I can, I can soak these grains like hard white, hard white spring wheat, for example, or hard red. I can soak it for an hour or two. Uh, it starts to soften it up and I can chew it. I don't even have to cook it. It's edible. If I let it go for two or three days and I can sprout it, I get vitamin content changed to vitamin C and so forth. I don't, I don't have time to explain this. There, oops. Other than right in here, there's a razor blade with a needle that's shoved down in the case here. And there's some dental floss that's wrapped around here. Here's duct tape on a pencil. Uh, there's all kinds of, here's a, and that needle's in there. Here's a spool of thread you can get for like 15, 20 cents a spool throw it in here. Here's survival instructions, how to make a solar still and get the sterile water out of the desert or wherever you can get sunlight. This is the cover of it. It tells you what's in it, uh, or it, it shows you what it can be used for. And it, show, it tells you what's inside this. Then you go over here and it shows you uh, 
uh, what's in it contents wise. Did you know you can use a leaf bag to make a solar still, a rain poncho, an overhead fly, a ground cover, rainwater catcher? Uh, I can turn around and dry the handy wipes and use it for toilet paper or a handkerchief or fire starter. There's all kinds of ways to use this stuff. I'm not going to get into this, but this is really good. When you get stressed out and you're in an emergency situation, read what's on this little page right here. It tells you some some amazing things. Uh, and uh, your mind is your greatest survival tool. And uh, at any rate, this is this will be somewhat self-explanatory and do's and don'ts in an emergency. This is all in this kit. And I'm, I'll make all these available to you guys. Uh, you can make your own and some families were giving them out as Christmas presents. And all I have to do is have three of these in storage for per person. They cost me like $7 a piece to put together. And I've got 24 hour food supply with fire starter that's waterproof and everything else. And if you don't have a sealer, you can put it in a gallon Ziploc baggie, heavy duty. And here's what the survival instructions look like. Shows you how to make a solar still, uh, shows you how to communicate SOS, it tells you about dry wood, how to figure out north, south, east, west with sunlight during the daytime, how to build shelters, uh, how to signal, uh, things of that nature. Uh, and I'm gonna, because we're on such a tight time leash, I'm gonna slow down a little bit. I still have a half hour. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, does anybody have any questions at this point in time? Yes. <clears throat> Dave, this is Lana from Sheboygan. You and I and Heidi have been on a, um, uh, a Zoom call in the past, which was great. You mm -hmm. are a wealth of information, and I feel like I could listen to you for months. Um, <laughs> Would you possibly be willing, if there were some things that we wanted to go in depth further on, would you be willing to focus in on a couple of those things and really dive deep yes. um, in the future? I, I would be happy to. I actually have dozens of PowerPoint presentations I've put together over the years, and I have lots of references, and I drill down on like alternative energy for home or uh seed saving. I mean, there's just so many different angles people can go on. And there's a lot of experts out there in some of these fields. But uh, yeah, that'd be wonderful. We would we would really, really love that. I don't know if there are specific um, things that the participants today have heard that they'd really like to dive deep on, but maybe we could um, take a survey and see if there's some things more in the future that we could uh, pick your brain on. You're just awesome. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things that I will tell you that is an absolute passion of mine is, besides a lot of these things, is that the mobile ready, foot level mobile ready, be backpack ready. And to me, if you're that way, you can throw it in your car and you know you've got the essentials with you. You've got your water purifier, you've got your magnifying glass long after. And by the way, I didn't tell you this, but the magnifying glass, one of the reasons why I like using that to start a fire if I've got a book of matches and I've got 20 matches in there, if I'm lucky and the wind doesn't blow it out or other things could happen, uh, I might be lucky if I can start 20 fires. But with a magnifying glass, instead of using my matches up first, I use a magnifying glass if I've got the opportunity every time to save every match so that when I really do need it at nighttime and there's no sunlight, I can start a fire if I had to. So, See, it's fabulous. Yeah, and part of what I want to tell you is when you have gasoline, propane, any of these fuels, don't just use them because they're in an emergency. Act like it's your last resort and save them for when it's urgent and you have you can't use sunlight or something else. Anyway, that's a critical point. So, Thank you. Uh, a quick question. Susan's wondering if you have a YouTube channel. Uh, I don't. But quite frankly, I'm looking at, I've, we've got a website that I haven't populated yet. But we have tons of information that I'd like to get on there and show a balance and an approach. But my thought is live abundantly today, prepared for tomorrow, inspired by purpose or empowered by purpose is our motto. So live abundantly today. Why not put in an edible landscape, for example, fruit trees, orchards, berry bushes, 
edible plants, edible flowers, uh, things that can save our lives or we can eat or whatever in hard times. Do it now while we can. And every year, like last year, I have 13 fruit trees, apples, pears, mainly because we're in a real cold climate, so we can't grow peaches. Uh, I picked 1,400 pounds off of my trees last year. I, I couldn't do it. Uh, at any rate, so we gave most of it away. But in, in pinch times or whatever, uh, fruit is nature's sugar. Uh, it's nature's sweetener and so forth. And it's amazing when you get off sugar. And I went off sugar for a year. Uh, didn't have any added sugar whatsoever. Just had fruit and stuff like that. What a difference it made. So at any rate, you're going to have square foot gardening class coming up. You can use, uh, and I'm going to show you some stuff real quickly. Medicinal plants are one of my priorities in storage. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, here is companion planting, sustainable practices. Uh, did you know that corn requires a huge amount of nitrogen? But if I put nitrogen fixers in there like beans around the base, they supply nitrogen to the corn. This is called the three sisters method. Then I can grow squash and so forth out the base here. What a power tool. This is what pioneers used to do when they understood this. This generates nitrogen fertilizer for corn that takes a lot. So I get corn, beans, and, and it's, they work together to support each other. This is a real cool sustainable practice. So there's just somebody's yard, but once they get the, garden, the bean seeds and they learn how to harvest their seeds, they've got a real sustainable practice here. Here's seeds that I, and things that I harvested out of my yard, sage, cardoon, parsley, onion seeds, garbanzo beans. I mean, there's raspberry leaves, raspberry tea, leaf tea kind of a thing, onions. And I, this is an affair we were doing up at Rick's College, but so many cool things you can do. Seed saving is absolutely regenerative. It's renewable. And if you don't have seeds, I highly recommend you get them while you can because they're gonna be harder to get moving forward, it looks like. And if you get seeds in a can, uh, uh, carrot seeds, for example, I graduated with a horticulture degree uh, way back when, initially. And uh, carrot seeds have a viability lifespan of sometimes two years and so forth. Other seeds like wheat sometimes can last for decades if it's stored right. And uh, at any rate, another thing that we've done, and this is not my house, but I've got some of these things where we can set them up. I can start plants with electricity. This, this requires electricity right here. This does not. Uh, for years, I started my plants in my kitchen window and I put little shelves in front of my kitchen sink here and we'd start the plants in there in December for tomato plants, for example. And I'd put them in my solar greenhouse in February. Anybody that knows anything about the area where we live, it's one of the coldest places in the nation in the continental United States. Uh, other things you can do uh, by putting in, I, oh, I wish I had time to get into this. I just, I just don't. But if you take straw bales and, and some glass doors or whatever, put it over top, you can extend your growing season where we're at out by two to four months with no electricity, no heat uh, or anything, just doing something this simple. This is what we call a cold frame. It doesn't have heat or anything like that. Here's one that's built where you can pop the lid and ventilate the heat when it starts getting too hot, like right here. But you can start all kinds, jumpstart certain plants that you can transplant out in your garden when the, the last frost is passed. This is just some ideas. Here's some examples of where people had square foot gardening. They raised the beds and then they made little frames that would go in here and they could throw plastic over it like this. And when it's gonna frost at night, uh, it can make your garden grow longer. See the snow right down here? These cold frames have green plants in here and there's more to it. I wish I had time to get into this. Uh, you can absorb heat energy during the daytime and get it to store up inside the frame in your corners like painting a one gallon bottle like these guys here flat black put them in the corners they absorb the heat during the daytime they radiate heat at night before it freezes these things have to cool off you can take little mini greenhouses stick it over plants you're trying to jump start when the frost might get them oh i could tell you some cool stories of things i've done just with stuff like this with five gallon buckets uh, and uh how fast plants can grow. This is just some ideas of ways of putting things together and growing herb gardens or vegetable gardens, things of that nature. If you're growing uh, green beans on the vine kind of a thing or peas or things of that nature, they have something to climb on here. 
This is square foot gardening method. Really quick, quick idea. These are some of the fruit trees I've got. I've got different varieties, a bunch of them. And I mean, these things get loaded and there's ways to do more natural pest control. Uh, this is a greenhouse I put together. This is March 4th, 2001. This is years ago. This is March 25th inside. I was doing strawberries. I was gonna transplant out there. You can see the soil temperature inside the greenhouse is 64 degrees in this little greenhouse. And I didn't have double walls, just a single wall. And, but it's stunning. Look at the snow slid off the front end here. And this is my, this is, this is my greenhouse in the winter. This is in this, when I first put it in before I actually tested it out. And I had a black barrel in the back corner filled with water and a black barrel over here filled with water. So it absorbs sun energy during the daytime, heat energy and at nighttime, it would radiate that heat back out into that space and save my plant. So our- But what's the uh, material uh, on the walls of your greenhouse there? It's just a corrugated polycarbonate type material that you can get from, that I was getting at that time from Home Depot. I just got this from Home Depot. And when I get down at the base here, I use uh, pressure treated four by fours for the base and pressure, anything you put pressure treated will never rot out on you. So it works great. I don't have time to get into this, unfortunately, but this is inside my bigger greenhouse that's solar. I have no heat in here whatsoever. This is March 25th. And this is March 4th, and we had almost that much snow sitting right outside. You can't see it because of the double wall polycarbonate. I had peas, onions, uh, my strawberries were gone. This here's in April, uh, towards the middle of April. This is where things are starting to grow. We had lettuce, carrots, all kinds of things. And here's the barrels that absorb the heat energy back in the corners. Uh, and so, at any rate, I got a lot of pictures. I, was going to show you here. Uh, what happened on the uh, below zero days? The below zero days, uh, it didn't freeze in there. It's wonderful. And so on the below zero days, it got cold, but it didn't kill the plants. They just, it just go into dormant mode. And then as soon as, I mean, if it gets cold enough, uh, like after December 15th around here, it finally penetrates and it gets cold enough to where it can start taking plants out. But I picked vine ripened tomatoes eight months from the middle of April. I started them in my kitchen window. I put them out there. I have no electricity whatsoever, no heat. And I put them out there in, in the first part of February. And I put, there's other things I did. I don't have time to get into it. Putting another bucket over top of them when I first started them out there in case the frost got through. And it go through two layers. So I put a a bucket on top of them at nighttime. Then uh, I picked clear into December 15th. So I got vine ripened tomatoes for eight months out of the year when we only have a 90 day, a three month growing season. Then I picked the green tomatoes and I could put those in storage and I could slowly ripen them up and I could get ripe tomatoes all year round out of a greenhouse that has in a cold climate like this. Uh, so at any rate, uh, let me look at the time here. Uh, I'm going to go through this very quickly. Uh, this is she has a lot of good information in her book. Uh, categories of sanitation, human waste, uh, separating the the pee from the poo kind of a thing is absolutely essential if you're in hard times. Uh, blended together, it could be a bigger hygiene disaster. But separate, they both can become benefits. Uh, urine can be used, for example. As a fertilizer, if you dilute it down, it's sterile, uh, unless you've got some kind of a sickness here in air effect or something. But at any rate, uh, human or personal sanitation, personal hygiene, bathing, laundry, rodents, pest control, and built up garbage like right here. How do we get rid of it in difficult times? Here's a five gallon bucket with a lid and you can go down and buy these lids for less than $10 or about $10 and you can put on a five gallon bucket. You've got a, a solid waste uh, like for poo or number two or whatever. Uh, if you want to wash your clothes, washboards like they used to uh, in a some type of a container or a way to take a spit bath or uh, be able to heat hot water up. I used to do this when I was up in the farm living in Canada as a kid. A uh, rodent control, 
uh, pest control. There's so many options. This is this isn't even doing it justice. But when you do a let's go to the next one here because this gets more into it. Toilets and supplies. You can take your toilet in your house, and I'm not going to get into this much right now. But if you have leaf bags, duct tape to hold it down, you can you can put your go solid in here, number two in here. Uh, put your urine. What we used to do when I was a kid is number ten can out on the porch. Uh, women have a different way of doing it, and that's using this device down here called uh, a urination or it. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting this. At any rate, this device here can be used to extract the urine so you can separate the two while you're using the restroom or whatever. As the solids build up, you add kitty litter, a little bit of soil on top, uh, sand, uh, organic matter, peat moss, things of that nature. You can put a little tiny layer on top until this is almost full. You pop the lid open. You take the bag out, stick it in a five gallon bucket so it doesn't rip apart on, and fall on the floor or something like that. Take it out and there's a way to dispose of it. And I don't have time to get into how to do that. It's very simple, but it's very powerful. These are some things that are recommended when you run out of toilet paper. Uh, you can use uh, handkerchiefs, you can use pieces of fabric or whatever uh, and cut in pieces. And then when you use it, you can dispose of them and we used to do it when I was growing up. We used to wash baby diapers because we didn't have disposables. Uh, there's whole books out on that uh, where there is no doctor, where there is no dentist or two books that are great. Another one is uh, the toilet paper book. Uh, what can you use? How do you deal with it? How do you recycle this and get it to where it's sterile and sanitary again? And so these are just some real simple basic things, but knowing how to use it is in the book and fantastic. Some of these things, uh, like uh, female uh, protection and so forth. Uh, when that's gone, what do you do? There's books out there that'll tell you how to get that type of information. But these are some basic things that you can have in a uh, get rid of human waste uh, mode. Uh, some of the sanitation supplies that you can, or hygiene supplies that you can incorporate as well. Hydrogen peroxide, again, rubbing alcohol. I don't have time to get into all these uh, in person, I'm just giving you some ideas. Ziploc baggies, uh, there's reasons to use that and ways to use those. Uh, shampoo, soaps, uh, hand sanitizer, just some of the basic things that we see here. Feminine supplies are going to be really important. Uh, uh, one of my favorite things to have is a washcloth towel and then use a solar box cooker to go out. And when I get done washing them by hand, I can put them in there to completely sterilize them. And I mean, it kills all the bacteria. Once you get, you can pasteurize water, purify water when you get it up to 160 degrees. Uh, and I've read different things on it, but for 10 minutes, uh, it'll kill almost everything in there. The big thing is if you can get your fabrics, your cloth, your materials, your baby uh, things, your toothbrushes, your uh, toilet paper, re recyclable toilet paper, you put it in there and heat that up. And, oh my goodness, what a blessing that can be. Uh, so at any rate, I didn't, I didn't want to wipe out all our time here. And I've gone through a lot of things and I had a whole section here that's not in my presentation disappeared. I was going to show you any, any rate. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question on that rocket scope. Is that in any way, shape or form safe to use in an enclosed garage or is there any way you could use it in your house without worrying about toxic um, smoke or anything coming off? And I, and I couldn't understand you there, Linda. Is somebody able to hear a little better than I can? I'm oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Now? Yeah. Are you able to use your rocket stove in your home or like in a garage or do you have to be outside? No, it's, it's used outside. Uh, one of the reasons why I like, there's a lot of different rocket stoves out there. I can make a rocket stove with a shovel. I could go outside if I have a clay type soil. I mean, See if I can find a picture of it here. I can I can go outside, dig a hole, uh, 
And if I set it up right, and then I have an air vent that comes in at an angle to this little narrow hole that I've got, I could literally make a rocket stove in the ground without metal or anything like that. But people can't use what they don't know. They can't use what they don't have. I, I like this style. There's other models. There's a bunch of different types out there that are available. Any of them are better than nothing. And some of them are collapsible. I wanted something that had eighth inch steel wall. I wanted something so heavy duty that if a building burned down and that's all that was left, I could pull a stove out and it wouldn't melt or deteriorate. So quarter inch or eighth inch plate steel is what I, there's a company here locally that can make these things, but they're available online. They're about 110, $15 up to 200, $300, but they're worth their weight in gold. Use it outside and uh, uh, definitely. So it's a little bit inconvenient that way, but let me tell you a couple things. When it comes to fuel, did you know that, a, and I used to, and I took architecture uh, in my early days as well. And when I got in there, I found that the average fireplace that didn't have a insert that was energy efficient, 95% of an average fireplace of all the heat energy that fire makes goes up the chimney, it sucks the air out of the room. And the heat energy is vented straight up the chimney. With uh, a airtight stoves, they're far more efficient. They use way less fuel and they radiate a whole lot more heat out instead of just blowing it up the chimney. With these rocket stoves, if you're standing outside and you build a fire and you're everybody standing around the fire, you can feel the warmth. How much firewood do you have to throw on a wood burning fire when it's cold outside to keep you warm? It's, it's, there's two ways of getting warm. One, when you chop the firewood to put it on the fire, and the other way is when you burn it. But when you're burning it, it's just sucking all the cool air off the ground to the fire, feeding oxygen, and then it's blowing, and your heat's going straight, most of it's going straight up. The radiant part of it's radiating out to us as we're standing there. The thing I like about the rocket stove is I can burn twigs and boil water instead of having to start a big fire and using a lot of firewood just to uh, a few sticks of firewood, I can use twigs. It's so much more efficient. And I can be out like a pioneer walking across the desert with a hand cart. If I had one of these things here, instead of having to gather a whole bunch of firewood to keep us warm and to cook or whatever, I could, do, I could light a fire with just a few twigs and boil a quart of water real easy, where it would take me a whale of a lot more on a regular fire. So one of my favorite tools, we gave these away for Christmas presents to our kids. What's your battery sparker in the list you've got up there right now? Okay, the battery sparker, it's just taking a batter, regular battery. I could take a nine volt uh, battery that goes in a transistor radio and I could start a fire with it. I just put it, I just short out across the two terminals and spark a little bit. And if I have tinder there, or steel wool or something like that, and I can get a spark started, then I can blow it into a flame if I do it right. And I highly recommend anybody who has not done this, go out and get a magnifying glass and learn how to start a fire without matches. It's so cool. You can start a glow. It doesn't poof into flames a lot of times. You can get it. You have to learn how to collect dry uh, materials and so forth. The same thing with a spark igniter or a sparker, just using a car battery as a spark source to create a spark that you can start a fire with. So if I have a battery and a piece of wire and I have some dry uh, uh, little uh, fluffy tinder type stuff, I can start, I can literally get a spark into it, and blow it into a, it starts into a flame and so forth. So that's what that's regarding to. When it comes to a magnifying glass, like I've got one right here, the bigger in diameter the magnifying glass is, the more energy you focus to the, to the focal point. I can start a fire with a, with a two inch in diameter magnifying glass, but I don't have near the energy uh, focusing on one point. So it takes, it's a little bit harder to get a spark. I, I mean, I can still do it easy, but it takes me longer. But with the bigger in diameter the magnifying glass, the more energy you're focusing and the easier it is to start a fire. And by the way, if you get a plastic lens uh, magnifying glass, 
the plastic lens magnifying glass, if you scratch them, they still can focus, but they don't do quite as good. The other thing I like about the magnifying glass is I can use it to read a book. If I'm near, if I can't read and my vision's bad and I need to read an instruction manual, I break my glasses. And by the way, in first aid, that's another thing I recommend, have a backup set of reading glasses or a backup set of glasses so that if you break your glasses or something happens, you've got that capability. But I can use a magnifying glass to read where I, my glasses are gone or missing or whatever. There's a lot of things you can do with them. I like glass lenses, but I make sure that when I carry it in my backpack, that I have it inside of a sock or something that's gonna give it a little bit more protection so I don't wanna drop it and break it uh, if I can help. So the glass is great, they'll last forever as long as you don't break them. The plastic's nice if I drop it, it doesn't break. And by the way, one last quick thing here. Does anybody on the call or on this meeting today know how to start a fire with ice? Did you know that if you take a piece of ice, you break it out, clear ice out of a puddle in the wintertime? And slowly but surely, if you use your hands and you form that ice into a magnifying glass lens shape, I could literally start a fire with ice. It's very hard and time consuming to do it that way, but I could literally use ice to create fire by turning it into a lens shape like a magnifying glass. You can't use what you don't know. You can't use what you don't have. There's stuff in nature that's all around us. There's people that have died of starvation laying on top of food, the plants that they didn't know were edible. Uh, and that's why I like putting the books in uh, storage and so forth. Uh, any, any more, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Sounds good. Uh, does anybody have any other questions? If not, I've got one other thing I give you here on a couple of book titles. Okay, uh, I'm gonna give you a few, let's see how much time we're almost up here. Now, here's some book titles that I really like. One of them is if you're into seed saving, and I highly recommend you get garden seeds, keep them in a cool, dry place if possible. Uh, and uh, if you're storing your seeds, get the book called Seed to Seed. And I'll, and I'll make this list available. I'll give you a book list of things that I, that I like that are great reference tools, especially when hard times come. Uh, harder times come, uh, or even daily, daily Excuse letter. me. Oh, Excuse ahead. me, Dave. Is it okay then to store our seeds in the freezer? Uh, there's a lot of them. I do that way. Okay. In, in so fact, uh, one of the big uh, storage centers, uh, long-term, that's one of the ways they do it. And you can do a little bit of quick research. We have the internet, but if you're looking things up like that, there's a lot of information. But uh, what's cool is just having the seeds. You can't, we can't, if we have, if we know how to grow and we have no tools and we have no seeds, we're in trouble anyway. If we have seeds and we have the tools, but we don't know how to reproduce, for example, which plants cross pollinate? Which ones do I have to be careful that I don't cross pollinate corn and come up with something different uh, than what I started with? And now I don't have my original true to type anymore. By the way, I'll tell you this real fast. Don't buy hybrid seeds. They don't grow true to type or they're potentially sterile or things of that nature. Uh, you want non-hybrid seeds. And if you get heirloom seeds, they're usually non-hybrid. They're not crossed in such a way that they will grow something different. I grew, uh, for example, uh, sunflowers and they had great big heads on my sunflowers. I collected the seeds and the next year, it was a sunflower with a head this big and there was all, the seeds weren't edible. And I was going, what in the world? And then I didn't realize it had crossed and I came up with something that wasn't even gonna produce anything worth, that was food worthy kind of a thing. So that's why I like the book Seed to Seed. It tells you how to protect things, how to cross pollinate. Some things are self pollinating. It gives you all that information. Another book that I would highly, highly recommend 
I cannot stress this enough, my number one favorite thing in health and in emergency times is water, water, water. Uh, your body's many cries for water. There's a scientist that did research for 20 years and they drilled down in his book. You'll see the whole story. It's a stunning story. When he got done, he went out and it's called Your Body's Many Cries for Water. And the other book that he wrote is called You're Not Sick, You're Thirsty. They're worth their weight in gold for inspiring people to start drinking the right water levels and why to do it and uh, so forth. He said, and he claimed in there, that half of all the diseases that people would get, half of them would be eliminated if people just help their cells to operate. Oh, I wish I could drill down on this. And you saw, my, you saw the pictures I showed you, those two blood samples, 24 hours apart. What happens when you're not getting enough water sometimes? It's, it's stunning. Any other questions? I have two questions um, in the chat. How do you store your books? Uh, good question. Uh, if you uh, I have them on the shelf here, but I, I have a list of what I would grab if I had to in an emergency. But one of my favorite things, and I'll tell you this right out of the gate here, I didn't get into this either, but if you have sealable uh, buckets uh, and you have to store stuff, uh, uh, there's a whole other level of information here, but uh, things of that nature where you can put them out in the rain, your house is burning down and you don't have anywhere to go and all of a sudden you're, in the, you're out, in, out in the middle. There's nothing more empowering uh, for storing things dry wise than to turn around and have buckets or barrels that have shingling lids on them so that the, if it's raining, the water runs over the top of the lid, doesn't go down the lid and, and leak in. Let's see if I can show this up. At any rate, it doesn't leak back into the container and get things wet. That's where I'd put my books. Uh, that's a whole nother topic. There's some really cool things you can do. Another one of my favorite things in storage is uh, number 10 metal cans that typically like the church uses for storage. What a gold mine. And after you use them, I don't throw them out. I use them for storing things. I, I get plastic lids for them. I can store cold water in them. I can keep things dry. I can... Uh, flip them upside down, punch holes in the top, turn it into a little cook stove. I can boil water in it, use it as a pan. I got so many different uses for that. Anyway. Okay, next question. Um, what kind of cookware do you like to use on your rocket stove and similar open fires? Boy, am I glad you brought that up. One of my absolute least favorite materials is aluminum. It's not good for your health. And I put aluminum, I had aluminum when I was out camping and uh, out uh, backpacking and I left it on the, water, on the fire and the fire boiled all the water out of my fry pan. And when I came back, there was a hole in the pan about two inches in diameter, the aluminum just melted. My favorite metals are cast iron and stainless steel uh, long-term. The house can burn down and I've had stainless steel turn red hot and it warps sometimes a little bit, but I can still use it. And Is by the way, oh, go ahead. There's, some, there's some super materials. I'm going to give you one more tip here. When it comes to buying clothing or when it comes to buying sewing thread or coats or things of that nature, anything that's made out of polyester, not poly, polyester is UV resistant, it won't break down in sunlight and it'll last for years. And so when you're buying thread, I don't buy cotton thread, I buy polyester thread. There's super materials in storage and that's one of them. If you get clothing, it doesn't rot, it doesn't mold, it doesn't mildew like, uh, in a, like a cotton can and break down and so forth. And uh, so stainless steel, cast iron, cast iron is a lot heavier, stainless steel is a little easier to pack. Uh, and so forth if you're on foot. Um, and going off of your clothing, I know in the past we've talked about tents and you were going to mention something about tents. Oh yeah, polyester tents. Uh, and by the way, when it comes to quality, I'd rather buy something quality like a tent that has fabric that won't rip apart, fall apart, 
so I, I lean more towards the polyester side of things. If you get nylon and polyester rope, uh, polyester twine, things of that nature, they don't break down. Have you ever seen a sheet of plastic and they break down in sunlight over a period of time and they just kind of rip apart, fall apart? That's UV. Ultraviolet light is absolutely destructive to certain materials. So when it comes to tents, that's one of the critical things. When you buy a tent, if you're going to buy a backpack type tent, you want one that's, uh, you can get one that just has a little top on it and it basically keeps some of the rain off. I like to get one that has a three quarter outer shell uh, so that uh, it shingles away the water. And because if your tent starts losing its uh, waterproof nature, so to speak, and you don't have that extra cover over the top of it, all of a sudden you can be laying in the tent and you got water dripping on you. So uh, when it comes to bigger term, long storage type tents, the military has some military surplus start stuff. You can get tents that are, you can make as big as you want. You can make a hospital out of it. That's what they used to do. They come in sections 20 feet by eight feet. They're aluminum framed. Uh, that's all another discussion. But when it comes to tents, the material is critical. And then get a heavier fabric grade, not something that's so lightweight that you can almost stick your finger through it. I get something that's a little more longer lasting. And then I highly recommend for that model of tent or that type of tent, go online and look up reviews. How long do they last? People that have been there, done that. I don't want to talk to somebody. Oh, I got bought this tent. It was fantastic. How long have you had it? One month. Well, you have a chance for the sunlight to work it over yet. Have you, have you used it more than once? Well, I haven't used it at all. I set it up to look at it and it looked great. You know, I think it's great. I want somebody that's been there, done that. So anytime you look at reviews, make sure you get to the people who have been experienced for years, not just a few weeks or months or maybe a year or so. Any further can... questions before we wrap up? Dave, do you have a, an email address that we could use to talk to you about a few things further? Would you mind sharing that with us? Yes. The email address and I'll make all this available is Dave, just D A V E, at selfreliantliving.com. It's just Dave at selfreliantliving.com. No hyphens or anything in between the words, it's just S E L F R E L I A N T living l i v i n g dot com so it's just david silverland living dot com and, and i'll what i'll do is uh, i'll see if i can get set up uh, a little google uh docs type thing that i'll make some of this stuff uh available that'd probably be the easiest way for me to put some of this stuff up there that you guys can have access to thank you you're welcome all right, one last call. All right, Dave, thank you so much for this information. Um, I'm gonna stop recording right now.